So uh, my name is Zelda Kozabo, and I'm the assistant curator of the tetrapod collection, which means birds, mammals, reptilians, uh, reptiles, and amphibians. The first slide, uh, the, um, our series is called Way Cool. So the title of the lecture has to end in Way Cool. Forensic ornithology is way cool. Mine might have had a title like It's a Match or something like that. Um, there is a society called the Society for Wildlife Forensic Science. And when we have conferences, we have great fun putting on the CSI bit and yelling it's a match. So the reason I'm saying that is one of the reasons why I like it is it's a puzzle. It's fun. You get to sort things out with not enough information till you get an answer, or occasionally you're stumped. So this first slide, uh, I'm going to start at the far side. This was a wonderful picture that was sent to me. These feathers are 2,000 years old. They were found in a cave in Colorado. And they dated them using the, car, the fire that they found close by. Um, there was, um, anthropologists don't like you to undo things. Um, so there was great um, enthusiasm to really look at these feathers, hoping to get a species that was extinct or was not normally found in Colorado. Unfortunately, that didn't happen. happen. It turned out to be uh, various um, beautio hawks uh, that still live there, and uh, long-eared owls, and a few other things. Um, but lots of excitement when the picture comes um, to you via email. The slide, uh, the picture up at the top was taken in one of the back rooms of the Museum of Anthropology. And in this case, what we're doing is identifying the feathers in the artifact. And this is a gentleman we'll see off and on in the pictures. This is Pepper. He works at the US National Fish and Wildlife Forensic Lab. And in this case, he's working with illegal stuff, shipments that people were not supposed to bring into the country. So uh, what other interesting stuff? you get to work with? Well, occasionally you get to go to the land of the dinosaurs. And this was something that was given to the uh, forensic division um, at the Smithsonian to identify. And I don't know whether you can see it, but it's a feather in amber. So, and they weren't able to do anything with that one. It had no down, and, but they certainly had a lot of fun trying. So, um, People say, well, what kind of birds are involved in forensics? And the answer is almost all kinds. Uh, the green, the large green triangle is the perching birds or the passerines. The red is hawks, eagles, and falcons. And we've also got the woodpeckers in the light green, and uh, owls are black. But basically, all types of birds are involved in uh, forensic investigations. This picture also shows different types. Um, Something that gets confused, especially because of the CSI type TV shows, is the difference between um, pathology determining cause of death, death and um, uh, avian morpho, morpho, uh, forensic morphology, which is what I'd be called. So I would be called an avian forensic morphologist. So in this case, it's quite clearly an eagle. And the pathologists at a forensic lab would determine the cause of death, whether it was shot, whether it was electrocution, whatever reason it was brought to the lab. But the identification of the bird would be done by um, uh, an avian morph forensic morphologist. So um, when you have a whole carcass, life's quite easy. When you don't have a whole carcass, it is not as easy. And there's other times when it isn't as well. In the case of oil birds, they can be very confusing to identify. Um, the picture up there of Pepper, uh, all this came out of someone's house, and all of it was illegal. So in that case, um, he got to go to the warehouse where they were keeping it prior to going to court. The other thing you get is um, these are all different kinds of hornbill skulls, different ages, different species. And in this case, um, they were imported into the US to make uh, herbal medicines. So that's investigated as well. Got a little too far away from my computer. Um, so here's the labeling. Um, and I'm not going to read this out. You guys can, in terms of the uh, types of evidence that um, forensic scientists would be looking at. This particular case 
involved a restaurant. So there was suspicions, and the freezer was raided. And um, on the menu, it said that people were eating pheasant. But it turned out they were eating woodcock and pheasants, and that they were being caught out of season. Or, uh, and the uh, pigeon, I can't remember what I said, woodcocks and pigeon. And the species of pigeon is illegal to hunt at any time of the year. So, um, but when Pepper got this shipment, he just got great big plastic bags with no feathers. So what did he do? Because it's hard to identify. He put them in the beetle colony. And we have three beetle colonies here. And a beetle colony is exactly what it sounds like. These are called domestic beetles. They do a wonderful job. And you put in what you need to be stripped down to the bone. And they do it for you. And a lot of people think they're really cool because they're writhing masses of whatever. But what comes out of the beetle colony is um, something like this one. And I'm going to be talking about this case in a minute. So here come, uh, they knew it was a type of um, rail, but they weren't sure which one. So um, they put the skull in the beetle com uh, colony, and then they were able to compare it to reference specimens and determine that it was a Sora. Now this was kind of a fun study. It took place in uh, Florida. And they decided the Burmese python is uh, very popular in the pet trade. And it's kind of like the um, Easter bunnies that end up at Jericho Park. People get tired of their pet snake. So there was this park where people had a habit of releasing their snakes. And they were growing rather large. And there was concern about whether or not a child might be eaten by one of these. So they got a lot of people together and organized a study and decided that for one month, they would uh, basically kill and catch every Burmese python they could. So it was kind of a crazy study that went in different directions. And this is a study where you would need skeletons sometimes, and sometimes you could identify the birds um, using feathers. Here at UBC, we had a graduate student visit us uh, from McGill, who was um, looking more, his main topic was basically the breeding behavior of the uh, bald eagles at Boundary Bay, because they are, the nest areas are much closer together here than they are in um, most parts of North America. But he, um, to augment his studies, he decided to basically go around with your garbage bag and collect everything he could find un under the nests to um, just uh, fill in his thesis and say they were eating all sorts of things. So this is, um, we had fun while we were doing the forensics on this, and we put the species around the sample, which is uh, actually on the board. Um, so we, the the uh, number of species the uh, bald eagles was eating, uh, were everything we kind of expected plus a few. So they were eating grebes and ducks, and um, we also found some little passerines, but we weren't sure. Whoops, I, I jumped ahead of myself. Now, not only are you identifying feathers, but you also have to know the variety in individuals. And this picture is not all of them. There are about 18 subspecies of peregrines uh, in the world. But you can see that the peregrines are not all the same. Some are very gray, some are very brown, some are very light, some are very dark. So if you found a peregrine feather out at Boundary Bay, uh, you could identify to either be an anatom, a tundras, or peels, which are the three subspecies we have here. And if you know which subspecies, you know more about the biology, you know more about where they breed, where they spend the winter. So that it's not just identifying the feather in that, that is in that uh, sometimes you can get additional information. And it also can be hard because not all feathers look alike. I'm going to talk a little bit about the legal stuff. This is actually one of the displays in the museum. We're lucky to be in Canada. Because in Canada, we can legally own feathers. So if this bald eagle feather 
was at Jericho Beach and you found it, you could take it home. Don't do that in the States, $10,000 later. Oh. Not nice. So, but the rules are, there are rules in Canada in that it, you can't go up to an eagle corpse and pull out the feather. Because <laughs> now you are in big trouble. So remember when you see the feathers on the ground, if it fell to the ground the same way that an autumn leaf falls to the ground, you can own it. But if it's got any blood, muscle, or tissue, we have very stringent laws against the possession of such things. So, um, and sometimes the reason I say it is because we are so close to the border, if you see a nice feather on the American side, they're not even allowed to own the feather of a robin. Just leave it on the ground, come home, don't take it. Okay, so, because um, we kind of forget about that, and um, if you want to get really confusing in Australia, you can put parrot feathers in your hat in the Northern Territories, but it's illegal in uh, Sydney. So it can vary within a country as well. So I mentioned there's laws governing that, and just be aware of that. Now, in terms of the forms that feathers take as they cross borders, it can be in ways that you wouldn't think of. There are people that collect uh, fishing flies, and they would just love to have one with a passenger pigeon feather in it or something like that. That would really be the star of their collection. And that um, has actually happened. And there's um, an interesting case. Um, a 22-year-old musician American, for some reason, was able to, sw uh, to steal birds of paradise out of the British Museum. And then he was selling them on the internet. And it was for making fishing flies. And just for fun, I looked up the blue bird of uh, paradise. And it said, coming soon. And when he got caught, he's now in jail. So, um, so I'm getting back to illegal trade. This is a close-up of um, something we saw on the first, very first slide. And this was this gorgeous um, Amazon cape that is made out of the deck or the um, inner tail feathers of macaws. And it's, it's, it's an amazing thing. I mean, it's, I don't know, how, I know when I'm holding it, it's six or eight feet, but it's amazing. Now, when you get that and you want to go to court, you know you're going to be asked certain questions. You're going to be asked, how many birds did it take to make this? Um, so that you can, so that the judge has an idea of the nature of the offense, whether it's one bird or whether it's a lot. The other thing is that you have to positively identify it. And in this case, they were using blue macaw feathers from quite a few different species. The dark ones are hyacinth macaw. The red ones are scarlet macaws, and the yellow ones are blue and gold. And so in terms of, so that you ha would have to look at every single feather. And how does that work? Well, these are actually the same two feathers. They're, um, they're the inner secondaries. So it looks this way in a scarlet. Uh, this was a green-winged macaw. It looks this way. Um, on the dorsal surface, but it looks red on the ventral surface. And then I flip the other two. So you have to look at feathers thoroughly. But in terms of the illegal trade, you do get to look at heavenly things. Um, this is uh, harpy eagles are very special. And um, this is also a beautiful piece. And again, you have to know your bird anatomy so that you can figure out how many individual birds like did they have to was would that represent one harpy eagle or would that re represent two i actually don't know the answer i'd have to be able to count those feathers and some of them look layered now this piece i didn't have to worry about that this is one i did at the anthropology museum in that what they did here is they used the entire tail so just for fun does anyone have any guesses on what those two tails are I'm afraid not. There's a hand back there. Um, gross? Nope. It's fairly hard. There's a problem with a feather when it's not attached to the bird. 
So what we have here is this one is a goshawk, and it's a juvenile. And this is um, a female harrier, northern harrier. They're the ones that fly in a V in a dihedral um, over the marshes in uh, Boundary Bay. And then the feathers on the side are a uh, blue um, form of the, um, what's the goose that we have in tens of thousands? Snow. snow, thank you. Blue morph of the snow goose. Okay, now in this particular headdress, which is also at the Anthropology Museum here, uh, headdresses are usually made out of two or three eagles. Now sometimes life gets very complicated. This was another piece that was a lot of fun because it's feathers that you're not as familiar with. So one thing you can do is um, they've got that um, open storage system at the Anthropology Museum. And it can be great fun to go over there and just guess what you're seeing. Uh, when you describe things, again, you have to be precise. This is a flamingo feather. So instead of saying pink, you actually use guides and you can say, I'm calling it this color using this reference. So the other thing about feathers is they change as the bird wears them. This is a very common bird, it's a starling, but there's a lot of birds that when the feathers are first grown, they have a buffy edge, either on the um, coverts up there or on the flight feathers, and that wears off, which is how our starlings start off spotted in the fall and end up all black in the spring. So I'm gonna have a drink of water here, and now we're gonna get into airplane strikes. Okay, so airplane, Air, airplane strikes, or avian strikes, and whatever you want to call it, is the most famous application for um, avian um, forensic morphology. Um, and one of the reasons is because there's big money involved. The airplane manufacturers of the engines, whenever there's a problem or the pilots hear a thunk in the engine, which they must report, they want it to be a bird. It's much e better for them that a bird collided with the plane than they built something wrong and the entire fleet has to be grounded. So uh, the best known lab in the world for doing this is uh, the Feather Lab at the Forensic, uh, at, sorry, the Feather Lab at the Smithsonian. And in Canada, it used to happen at the Canadian Museum of Nature, um, but um, uh, that went uh, defunct in 95 and the contract went to the Smithsonian. So it can, uh, the airstrikes can take many different forms and uh, I'm not going to reread the slide, but they cause significant damage. So what actually ends up at the lab is called smarge and that's just good fun, you know, invented a word for it. Sometimes it can be quite easy to identify uh, as in the um, top uh, corner. And sometimes it's literally a paper towel or these days a swab. So that would end up going to the lab and be identified. And most people would expect in this modern era that you would do just strictly DNA. But there's lots of times when this doesn't work. So um, I'm gonna just tell you a short story. And it has to do with the picture at the top, which is um, uh, a US um, Air Force plane. And at the Smithsonian, they had three people in the mor morphology, and they decided they had to get a DNA person. So she started her first day, and she's shown the desk, and she's given a bloody sample. And um, you know, everyone's sort of saying hi, and the next morning she's asked, how's it going? Oh, great, you're settling in. How's the equipment? Great, end of the afternoon. How's that sample going? I'm working on it. Next morning, I'm working on it. What's going on? What do you think it is? She says, I have a match. White-tailed deer. Her new boss says, hmm, something hits a fighter jet at 27,000 feet. White-tailed deer, fascinating. So she asked for the sample. And what she did is, in the sample, she looked for little wispy bits. And on these feathers, there are such wispy bits. And she took that, and she put that underneath the microscope. 
And she was able to identify it as a black vulture, which had been eating a white-tailed deer, which collided with a fighter jet at 27,000 feet. Mm -hmm. So basically, the blood of the white-tailed deer overwhelmed the sample. But it was not the true story, because we all know Bambi can't fly. <laughs> Not even to Christmas. So, um, oops, sorry, occasionally I forget where I'm going. This is a particular um, picture that some of you may know. This is the uh, plane that had to land in the Hudson River. And one thing that was of great concern in this one is they, d they knew right away it was Canada go goose, but they had to prove it. But they also wanted to know whether it was a resident geese or whether or not it was migratory geese. So they cleaned out the engines. They discovered that they had DNA from one male and two females. But by looking at the feathers and the ratio of heavy hydrogen to normal hydrogen, they were able to establish that the geese were migrating and had been breeding up in the Arctic. Because that ratio in the feathers is uh, laid down when the feather is grown. So after the geese um, and ducks do the same thing, after they have their young, they go through this flightless period, and they regrow their flight feathers. So there's all sorts of different uh, ways. Now, I told you the story about the vulture, but I didn't really explain how it works. So you have the two parts of the uh, feather, and this doesn't really work with eagle feathers, but whatever. This part is the part that flies, and it turns out that the hooks and eyes, the Velcro section, is the same in almost all birds. And that's not that much of a surprise because the fact that these are so strong, um, there's probably very few ways it can be designed to be as strong as bird feathers are. But this part here, the downy bit, turns out to be very, very different in the different kinds of birds. So that's the part that you use, the, uh, basically the down or the uh, barbules, as it's technically called. And uh, at the end of those, you have, whoops, a slide that's not supposed to be there. Oh, there it comes, OK. Um, basically, the, the ends of the cells, or the expanded nodes, can have all these different shapes. And every order of bird has a different shape. So um, something's going on here. OK. Oh, this is Pepper being cute. OK. So basically, you can tell ducks from game birds very, very easily, because one of them has rings, as in the game birds. And in ducks, it looks like uh, little triangles, and it's only at the end. Now, some pictures I've taken here. This is uh, a crane, so it's a different shape. And this is um, a kind of flycatcher, uh, much more what a pass rhyme would look like. And I'm all cut up here. Is the sound still OK? OK. And um, in this one, this is a woodpecker. And if you look close to where the actual uh, shaft is, you can see these little hooks. And that's distinctive for woodpeckers. So that's what they were looking at. So we're getting on to the last bit. If I'm uh, sent a forensic case, what usually arrives is a box. So this particular box was from, um, from Ottawa. It was from the Wildlife Enforcement Branch of Environment Canada. And it, collect, it contained a collection of um, uh, airport seizures, just one or two feathers that had been found in various people's luggage. I numbered them, and basically they said, can you identify these? And I said yes, so then they set the box. But when it arrived, I discovered it was actually in different bags with different case numbers. So my numbering is kind of crazy, because once you've given a feather or an artifact or a piece of evidence, uh, this is non-criminal. Um, but um, uh, uh, I'll take that back. It, it was a criminal offense for the people to have these uh, feathers at the airport, but it's not going to be pursued. It's just going to be confiscated. So um, once you've assigned a name or a tag to a piece of evidence, you can't change it again, or else you create confusion. So here is something I've showed you before. You take the um, feather that came in the sample, and you just match it up, and you say, yeah, that's a trumpeter swan. No problem. But you also look at 
other structures, not just the size and the color. You look at the way that the shaft is made. Now in this one, there's the reference feather on one side and the, Canada, and the, um, the one you try to identify on the other. And it's a Canada goose. But the part I want you to look at, because when you're down at the beach and you find a brown feather and you go, Eureka, I've got a bald eagle feather, you've got to look for this first. And that is on the inside, and you'll be able to see it up here. I've got uh, Canada geese feathers in the jar. Is there, it looks like melted plastic. And it's called the tegum, and it's found on waterfowl. And that's a really good way to know that you don't have an eagle feather. And then the, here was the most interesting bunch. So I looked, I did the little one first, and it was a common raven. And I compared it in size and morphology, and it also had this interesting pattern on the, um, on the shaft, the little chevrons. And I've got some of these up here, I believe, so you can look at that later. And here's a blow up of it. Now, back to the really interesting one. You measure a feather by straightening it out. But this one's already 61 centimeters, and it's curved. So I looked at what it might be and discovered that this was really a huge feather because it's way too big to be a wood stork, whooping crane, or a golden eagle. So I started comparing it to feathers that I had. And I sort of got into trouble because I didn't have the reference collection that I needed. We unfortunately do not have a California condor, Andean condor, or any old world vultures in the collection. Um, someone gave me a um, California condor feather. It's, it's not, it doesn't look very good, but it's better than nothing. And it's in that picture. But I, at this moment, knew that, that uh, the extra long feather, I forgot that case. It's in the office. <laughs> OK. I meant to bring that box and show you this feather. So um, I now had it down to two. And I'm still having a quandary, and I still haven't decided what it is. It's my personal hunch that it is an old world uh, vulture, but I can't prove that. And because um, that's the big difference between forensics and an opinion. In forensics, you have a pitch, uh, um, e you have either a photograph that proves your opinion, or you have some other method of proof. So there's something about uh, this ridge which is happening in the feather which is not present, um, which is in the uh, condor feather which is not present in the unknown feather. In terms of this, um, it looks a lot like eagle feathers. And the way that the shaft is twisted over the rawhide is very typical and found with wood. Whoa. That's me, isn't it? OK, sorry about that. Um, so I looked at this. and. Then I looked at the end of the feathers and said, there's something wrong. But when you look at it up close, you can see that someone took a pair of scissors at it. And that's not unusual. So a lot of the forensics, feathers are often modified. So you have to look past that. So now I'm trying to figure out for sure, not a hunch, whether or not those particular feathers, and I'll go back to them, and I want you to stare at them. Uh, the reference feather there is the, um, golden eagle wing versus these feathers. Now we have to sort out whether they're bald eagle or golden eagle. I could do it by um, uh, using microscope slides, but I thought it'd be more fun by doing it by looking at these slides. So this is a, a website by the Forensic Lab, and this is a set of primaries of an adult bald eagle. And this is an adult golden eagle. Now, we might be very tempted to say it's obviously a golden eagle because we had splotches. Uh, but you have to remember that that's what a juvenile bald eagle looks like. So you have splotches there. So that helps, but it's not definitive. What ends up being definitive is the way that the little point is at the end of the notch. And you're welcome to come up here and look at the bald eagle feathers afterwards. And it's much more pronounced and of a different shape in the uh, golden eagles. So it is a golden eagle. 
So um, just to sort of uh, white, uh, finish up, there's a list of all the feathers could be identified out of that box. I'm also working with the Vancouver Island Marmot Recovery Project. They put collars on the marmots when they release them and, um, and try to determine whether or not the animals died because they couldn't get enough food. But sometimes they find the collars and some feathers and just identifying who's eating them. Um, this was a fun one. Uh, the heath hen went extinct in 1930 in Massachusetts. And they started hybrid, uh, bringing in prairie chickens to breed with them in about the 1860s. So someone brought this in, and it would have been lovely if it was real, but it turned out to be a fake. So that was too bad. Um, and the, there's white spots here. And if something that looks like a heath hen doesn't have those white spots, then it's not considered to be one. Anyway, it took me a long time. Uh, the pictures of those two birds was taken at the American Museum because it actually, I think it's, that was just one confusing bird. And it was also faded. And all the other things I could look at, like counting feathers, ha the heath hen has less of them. But if it's a bird from 1860 or 1880, it can drop feathers. So you can't just count feathers and say that you've got what you've got. Um, sometimes you're asked to identify pictures and paintings. I haven't been done, uh, asked to do this. I have a friend who identifies um, and helps others identify apples and fruit in paintings and whether or not those particular trees are still around and uh, different varieties. And not all anthropology artifacts are in museums. This can be great fun. And just because I'm going on too long, here's a fun one. So here we have an absolutely gorgeous hat. And I've got two serious clues on what the black wispy feathers are in this hat and what the main feathers are. Would anyone like to call out what the feathers are? Duck. No, it's not a duck. Pheasant. Yes, because this is a male ring-necked ring, ring pheasant. And as I say, I've made it slightly hard. And what about the black wispy ones? Mm -hmm. Eagle? Nope. So what is that bird that you can see a little bit? I, I kind of had fun with the picture, making it a bit hard. No. OK, it happens to be a tom turkey. And that's the tassel. They have a tassel in the front. And if you start looking at that, it might look more like a, a turkey. So um, next week, we, the museum is very happy to be opening a new show, which is called Invoking Venus, Feathers and Fashion. And some of the hats that are going to be on display are mouth-wateringly fun. So I encourage you to come back and try out your forensic skills and have a look at these amazing exhibition that's being put together by Catherine Stewart, uh, Klaus, Yanka, I'm going to say that wrong, and uh, I, I, Ivan Sayers, because it's going to be spectacular. Now, on this one, does anyone have a guess? The bird is there. Big pardon? Exactly right. It's a helmeted guinea fowl. OK. Anyway, these are an amazing pair of shoes. So uh, I've got various things for you to, um, that basically concludes the lecture. And uh, I brought various books and feathers for people to look at. And I've got a wing here with no identification. And if you want to come up and try, the answer's underneath the piece of paper over there. You can peek and see what it is. So thanks for coming today.